Okay, good morning everybody. Today is Samech uh, Gimel, which is 63. New Mishnah. Lo yitzay ish lo basayif, velo bakeshet, velo betris, velo ba'ala, velo beroma. So these are various weapons. A person, a man should not go out with a saif, with a sword. Uh, we, were, we are presuming that this is referring to a sword which is hanging from the belt of the person in the style of a warrior type uh, get up. Velobakeshet, not with a bow. Velobatris, and not with a, um, a uh, shield. Velobalab, we'll see what that is later. Velobiromach, not with a spear. Vim yatsa, hayab chatat, and if you went out with any of these things, we don't look at it as a piece of clothing. We don't view it as an ornament, but we view a sword hanging or a shield hanging or a bow hanging as simply being the mode of carrying it. Just like if you have a wallet in your pocket or you have keys in your pocket, we don't say that it's adorning you. We say that you're carrying it. So, so too would, would be the case here. Rabbi Eliezer, Omer Rabbi Eliezer says, Tachshitin en lo. Actually, these are considered ornamental because if you think about it, soldiers like, you know, when the soldier goes out with a gun hanging, it's kind of, uh, it's part of their uniform. It's not just a it's not just practical, but people, uh, you know, when, when soldiers go for parades, they also go with their weapons because it's sort of part of their uh, getup. So therefore, Rabbi Eliezer says, this would be tachshitin. Now, he, you know, ostensibly, he would still say they couldn't wear it, but only rabbinically because they might take it off, not biblically, since, uh, since it would be considered to, to be part of their uh, outfit. Um, the Chachamim Omrim, the rabbis say, we can't look at weapons as anything other than a disgrace for a person. Because it says, because it says in uh, Yeshayahu that they will beat their swords into uh, shovels, you know, for, for digging. And they will beat their spears into pruning uh, implements. Yeah. And, and what? Well, yeah. And now here is a uh, here. There's a typo. It would seem in the Mishnah because it should say Lo Yisagoy Elgoy. It's not Vilo. Lo Yisagoy Elgoy Cherev Vilo Yil Medu Od Melchama. That they that nation will not lift up sword against nation, and they will not learn war anymore. This is obviously a very very famous uh, pasuk that appears uh, both in um, both in Yeshayahu and also in Micha. So the uh, uh, it's the same thing, yeah. Really? Uh, yeah. There, there's a there's a part in Micha which is very very similar to that parak in Yeshayahu. It's all, almost uh, that has almost quotes from it. Um, that has some other things in it, but too, but it's very similar, uh, almost word for word, on the pesukim to uh, second parak of Yeshayahu. Okay, so birit Torah v'yotzein ba bishabbat. Uh, it says that a uh, birit, as we're going to learn, is a type of uh, thing that a woman wears. No, no, birit here is a uh, is like a, uh, a they call it, I guess, a garter or something. It holds up the stockings of the woman. She puts it around her leg, and it holds up her stockings. Kivalim, however, kivalim tmeim ben yotzin ben So there are two halachot here. One is with regard to purity and impurity, which is that the the. Uh, Whatever the uh, birit is, as we're going to see a clarification of it in the Gemara, that is something which is not susceptible to Tum'ah, and you're allowed to wear on Shabbat. And the kivalim are some, is something that you're not allowed to wear on Shabbat, which we're going to see why in the Gemara, but is su- subject to Tum'ah. Now, those two things don't really relate to one another in any substantial way. In other words, it's not because one is uh, impervious to impurity that you're allowed to wear it out on Shabbat. That's unrelated. But we'll see that these two halachot are, uh, are going to be uh, explained in further detail in the Gemara. So the, there's also a problem with Neshek, uh, uh, if it's considered hooks or not, uh, also not forgetting about uh, right. Osad, I mean, let's say a person not on Shirut, he's not army, he's not on duty, and he, but they can move his rifle or not. Or, right. Well, one would think that if he's not on duty, he wouldn't be able to, unless there's a purpose. Uh, but the only plea to Shemush is the which is the right of the book, Nefesh is not uh, true, true, but uh, unless he's using it for that, I don't see why it would be uh, why it'd be allowed to. I mean, you could say that about many things. So the Gemara begins by saying, "Ma my be'ala? What's be'ala? Kulfa." So does it give a picture or anything? What kulfa is uh, there? What does it say? This is just a picture of the uh, the Ramach of the trees. 
Oh, so it's just it's a type of stick that they would use, okay? It's a type of a stick, but doesn't show you exactly what it looks uh, like. This they would use. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, it, it's a it's something that was used. Yeah, it's a type of weapon. It's a type of weapon that's shaped like a stick, but uh, they don't give an exact picture of it there. Um, Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Eliezer says, lo. So now we get into a very, very interesting discussion about our weapons, a uh, considered an ornament or not. So this is fascinating discussion. Um, so uh, Tanya, it says in the Brayta, Amru lo the Rabbi Eliezer, the Rabbi said to Rabbi Eliezer, Vechim achad the Tachshitine Tachshitine lo. If you're telling me that weapons are an ornament, Mepnei Mahin betilin the Mot Mashiach, so why are we going to have no weapons in the days of Mashiach? Okay. If they're so beautiful. Um, and he said to them, because at those days they won't need them anymore. In other words, it's culturally relative. Nowadays when we need them, they're considered to be a takshit. They're considered to be something beautiful. But in the future when they will be unnecessary, they will become obsolete and therefore they won't be beautiful anymore. Shinemar says, because it says that no nation will lift up a sword against another nation, which means that there will be anything obsolete will no longer be uh, considered an ornament. But right now, they will be considered an ornament because in our context, they're still used. Why can't we just say that even in the future then, even in Yimot Mashiach, when you don't need them anymore, they could still be beautiful. Like some people in their house, they have a sword on the wall. Yeah. You know, like one of those old swords, right? Nobody's going to take the sword and start fighting anybody like some samurai sword. It's like a piece of art, right? You've seen that. Yeah, pe- people have it as a piece of art, so why can't you have it as a piece of art? Because it's war like, okay, yeah. No, but the one that, that, one, that one cross looks like. Oh, it has a cross, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, they, but many people have different different kinds of uh, weapons that they have on the wall. They think it's a. Yeah. You can see a cross. See, right. Pop shows on television, sometimes they do it. So Amar Abaya Abaya said, "Me did have a shragavat yara." That it's the same thing as a candle during the daytime. In other words, when something is obsolete, when something is no longer used anymore, we don't look at it as beautiful anymore because it's no long, it no longer has any purpose. It's purposeless, and therefore, since in Yimot Hamashiach they won't be using weapons anymore, therefore people will not view them as beautiful either. They will just look. They'll just remind them of a of a time that was worse. They'll remind them of bad times. Well, people don't wear them, I guess. People wouldn't wear those, you know, putting them on the wall. It might be different. So, Upligad Shmuel, and this is a machloket with Shmuel, and this is a very, very famous statement of Shmuel in the Talbud. Amar Shmuel, in ben ha'olam azeli mot ha-mashiach, ela shibud galuyot bilvad, or shiabud malchuyot, as many have, bilvad, which means to say, there's no difference between nowadays and the Yimot HaMashiach except for the political configuration that the Jews will be independent. As it says, that there will never be a time that there are no poor people in the land. In other words, what Shmuel holds is that yes, there will be a Beit HaMikdash, yes, there will be peace and lots of good things, but the essential nature of humanity is not going to change. Just that the Jews will be independent, they'll have a Beit HaMikdash, they'll be able to fulfill all the mitzvot, but the prophecies that are described Described in the Nevi'im about absolute peace and everything. That's talking about uh, an even further time into the future. Uh, what, what's called here, uh, uh, what, what we're going to see, uh, olam, what they call here Olam Abba. In other words, uh, uh, either it's talking metaphysically in the next world and it's just describing it in uh, physical terms or something else. But basically nature will not change. Meaning weapons will never truly become obsolete hmm. because nature will not change. Now it might be true that people will won't fight with one another, but that's not going to be because of some fundamental change that people will look at weapons as obsolete. It will be because the Jewish people will be leading you know, humanity towards something better than that. But that, but that Shmuel has a more uh, limited understanding or more limited view of what it means for uh, what Yimot HaMashiach means. However, this goes in accordance with Rabbi Chayyab Arabah. Rabbi Chayyab Arabah that Yimot HaMashiach is exactly what's being described in Yishayahu when it talks about not needing any more weapons and beating them into uh, pruning hooks and all that, that's talking about But Olam Abba is something totally spiritual. We can't envision that at all. In other words, Shmuel seems to be describing two stages. A stage which we call Yimot HaMashiach, which is things are much better for the Jews. They're independent. They're not threatened by their enemies. They're able to learn Torah. They're able to do mitzvot. They have a Beit HaMikdash. But essentially humanity will be the same and a time even further than that in the future that's what the Nevi'im are talking about 
whether it means in the next world spiritually or it means some other future time that's even further ahead than Yimot HaMashiach. Whereas Rabbi Chiyabar Abba is saying, no, the way that most people think of it, that Yimot HaMashiach is the time being described in Yishayahu. And, uh, and, and uh, Olam Abba, we don't even have a concept of what it is. Okay, but what's described in the Nevi'im is Yimot HaMashiach, which is how most people take it. Vigad Amri and some people say, Amro Lala Rabbi Eliezer, that the rabbi said to Rabbi Eliezer, some have a different version. They asked him, if these are ornaments, why do they become obsolete in Yimot HaMashiach? Amar Lahani said to them, Af Yimot HaMashiach, Inan Betilin. That Rabbi Eliezer said, even in the Yimot HaMashiach, they won't become obsolete. Hanu de Shmuel, Upli Gad Rabbi Chiyabar Abba. In that version, Rabbi Eliezer is agreeing with Shmuel that there will never be a time in our, uh, in our world where weapons actually become obsolete. And that's in accordance with Shmuel and disagreeing with Rabbi Chiyabar Abba. So it is very unclear and very difficult to understand exactly how Shmuel uh, comprehends these nevuot, these prophecies of Yeshayahu that talk about peace on earth. Because when is it talking about? I mean, is, if it's not talking about Yimad HaMashiach, is it talking about some later time, even later, further ahead in history? Or is it talking about um, Yimad Is it talking about the Olam Haba and it's speaking in metaphysical terms? It's using physical description for metaphysical? Uh, we don't know. It's a very, very difficult... It's very difficult to understand what Sh- how Shmuel interpreted those Nivuot because he never tells us. He just tells us what he doesn't interpret, which is he doesn't interpret it that in Yimad HaMashiach we're going to be living in a utopia. We're still going to be living in a normal world, just that things will be much, much, much better for the Jews, indescribably better, but not, uh, but not a perfect world. So when is the perfect world that's being described? That it's not clear, according to Shmuel, when that's going to be. Uh, so in, in which case, according to Rabbi Eliezer, if he's following Shmuel, that's why he would consider, uh, he would consider the weapons to be a takshit, to be an ornament, even in Yimot HaMashiach, because even then they'll need weapons, according to that. Amrali Abai la Rav Dimi. Abai said to Rav Dimi. Amrali la Rav Avya. Some say that he said it to Rav Avya. Amrali la Rav Yosef la Rav Dimi. Some say it was Rav Yosef and not Abai saying it to Rav Dimi. Amrali la Rav Avya. Some say it was Rav Yosef saying it to Rav Avya. Amrali la Abai la Rav Yosef. Some people say it was Abai la Rav Yosef. So we have five different possibilities of who said this to whom. But in the end, the question is the same. My Tama to Rabbi Eliezer. What is the reason for, for Rabbi Eliezer's position? Damar Takshitin uh, Hello. That he says that weapons are a they're not just a practical uh, thing, but they're actually an ornament. Where does he get that from? Because it says in uh, in uh, Tehillim uh, that you should. Um, that the, it's, he says, "Chagor al yarech gibor." That put the uh, tie the sword on your belt, O mighty one. Okay, on your thigh, O, o mighty one. Hodecha v'adarecha. It is your glory and your uh, and your uh, radiance. You know, however you want to just however you want to translate hod v'adar. It's a similar, but it means you know your glory and the splendor. Okay, so your glory and splendor. So what is it saying to the? It's saying to the mighty person, the sword that you affix to your belt is your glory and your splendor. So that's where you get the idea that oh, it's it's glory and splendor for the mighty person to have this sword on his belt. Amarle Rav Kana Rav Kana said lemarre de Rav Huna to marre the son of Rav Huna. Hi bedivrei Torah ketiv. That pasuk that says mighty person put your sword on your belt because it's your glory and splendor is not talking about a, a physical warrior. It's talking about divrei Torah. And what it means is, Rashi explains, how is it interpreted in terms of uh, Divrei Torah? It's interpreted to mean that you should review and review and review your learning so that it's so prepared. It's like a weapon. It's like a sword on your belt. In other words, if there comes a machloket, there comes an argument, there comes a debate, there comes a question that you need to resolve, you're going to be prepared to get into the debate because it's going to be clear as day in your mind. That's what it means to have your sword on your belt. It means spiritually have your sword on your belt, not physically. So Amarli answered him, En mikrayo a famous line that no pasuk ever leaves its simple meaning. Which means to say, even though there might be a homiletic meaning, even though we might interpret this idea of the mighty person with the sword in a metaphoric sense, it still has the literal meaning. We don't abandon the literal meaning. As Rashi, many times Rashi says that in his commentary, that even if I have a, a, a midrashic interpretation, I still, have to, I still have to account for the literal meaning. And the literal meaning here is that the sword means a sword. And that the mighty person who has a sword on his belt is considered beautiful and, and uh, splendid. Amar Rav Kana. Rav Kana said, 
Kad Havena Bar Teman Esarei Shenin Vahava Gamir Na Lelekule Ashas. When I was 18 years old, I knew the entire Shas. Velo Hava Yadana Den Mikra Yodemi De Pshuto Ad Hashta. But until today, I didn't know that no pasuk can ever be taken out of its literal meaning. Meaning to say, he knew the entire Tanakh. Obviously, he knew the entire Shas. But he didn't know this principle that when there's a Midrashic reading of a Pasuk, we do, that doesn't mean that we abandon the literal meaning. It means that the Midrashic uh, interpretation adds on another layer of meaning. But we still have to accept the literal meaning. Why does, Micah Mashmalan, why does he tell us how many years he was studying? Why do we have to know that he spent 18 years learning all of Shas and will only now learn this principle? To teach you something. To ligmar inishvahadar Because sometimes a person can learn for many years and doesn't fully understand what he's learning. Rashi she explains that a person should learn he should learn the texts from his teacher even though he's not going to know the entire meaning that doesn't mean he doesn't understand what he's reading and he's just mumbling a bunch of uh, mumbo jumbo it means that he understands but not fully she says what does it mean afterwards he should learn he should learn the reasons behind it so what, what it means is that he didn't even though he knew a lot of stuff in other words he knew a lot of material he hadn't fully worked out the explanation the meaning the principles underneath all that he learned so he knew a lot of information like we teach children a lot of information but maybe they don't understand all the principles behind the information until much later so that's what he's, he's trying to teach you don't worry if You've, you're learning a lot of material, but you don't fully get the principles underlying the material yet because of, because ligros inish vadal lisbar because of, or ligmar inish rather vadal lisbar because a person can first master the texts and later understand the principles and even after 18 years he was still learning principles that he didn't know before siman zarot so now we have a siman which is going to be the siman of the next. Uh, four uh, agadot. Sometimes it will give you a mnemonic. Zayin Resh Vavtaf, which is going to help a person who wants to memorize this remember the order in which the next four agadot are going to be brought. That's the only reason why you have that word zarot there or zarut. So Amar Rabbi Yirmiya, Amar Rabbi Elazar. Rabbi Yirmiya said that Rabbi Elazar said, Shenei Tamidei Chachamim Hamehadedin Zela Zeba Halacha. HaKadosh Baruch Matzliach Lehem That two Tamlidei Chachamim That sharpen one another in Halacha In other words, they argue with each other Not to cause trouble But to question and to go back and forth To clarify the truth So such a person So Hashem, the Holy One, blessed be He Is going to give them success As Shnei Mars says V'hadaracha Tzilach Because it says V'hadaracha It says Your glory Tzilach Be, uh, be successful Okay in other, and what are they saying? They're taking the word vahadarcha, which means your glory. Al tikre hadarcha ela vechadadcha. You're sharpening, sharpen yourself, and Hashem is going to give you success. Velo od, and not only that, elish olin ligdula they achieve greatness. Shenamar tzelach rechav, because it says succeed and ride high. You're going to ride high because what is it trying to say? It's trying to say that many people are seduced by the idea that if they learn a lot of superficial stuff, they're going to be, be regarded by the uh, people, you know, by others as being a great Talmud Chacham. So he's saying, no, it's the sharpening. It's, you, you have to get in and sharpen and clarify and really get into depth in learning. And then when you've sharpened and clarified and you really understand from the give and take between uh, two people, now you're going to succeed and now you're going to rise up to greatness because you're really going to know what you're talking about. Well, yeah. That's why it's important. I had an American uh, Talmud teacher he used to say, Right? Yeah, true. Maybe you'll believe even if a person is doing this for the wrong reasons. In other words, he's not doing it to seek the truth, but he's doing it because he wants to show off how smart he is or he wants to give his friend a hard time. So he's bringing up questions in order to drive him crazy or whatever it is. So he says, This is all a pasuk from Tehilim. That's the same uh, Mizmor that had the thing about the Gibor that we read before. So now it's, it's, it's going further in that uh, same Mizmor of Tehillim that talked about the, uh, that talked about the you know, mighty person with the sword. So we're continuing in, on the same metaphoric track, that it's not talking about the mighty person, but it's talking about the person who's mighty in Torah. So uh, maybe you'll think even Shalom Shema, that's why it says Al Divar Emet, only if he's doing it for the sake of truth. That's when he'll succeed. But if you're doing it just to show off, or just to put down your friend, and then you're not going to succeed. Uh, what, if, what if you become arrogant and say to yourself, look at what a smart guy I am, I'm 
asking all these questions and everything is so clear and I'm the biggest genius ever. So Talmud Lamar Va'an Vatzedek, that's why it says, and, uh, and uh, humility and in righteousness. So what that means is that when is this going to happen to you? When is this going to be due to you? When you have anava. When you have humility along the way, and if you do this, then you will be able to be uh, to acquire the Torah, which was given by the right hand, as it says. And the 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 awesome thing from your right hand, the Torah will teach you. Okay, what it means is that if you succeed in this way, if you really delve into the Torah, then the, the awesome thing from the right hand, meaning the awesome thing from your right hand, Hashem, meaning to say the, the Torah is going to teach you even more and oh, it's going to open up new vistas to you. In other words, you see this? What is really the reward of learning lots of Torah? Learning more Torah. Because it says, what, what are you, what's going to happen if you learn Torah and you're really great? You're going to learn more. That's what the benefit is. Yeah. Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak says, Zochin the Dvarim Shenemru Biminash Shel Torah. You're going to have not only the Torah itself, but the things that it says regarding the right side of Torah, which means the Amar Rav Bar Rav Shela, the Amar Rav Yosef Bar Chama, because Rav Bar Shela said, and some some attributed to Rav Yosef Bar Chama, Amar Rav Sheshet, in the name of Rav Sheshet, My Dichtiv Orech Yamin Bimina. Bismillah Oshe B'chavod. What does it mean when it says that in the right hand of wisdom is length of days and in the left hand of wisdom is wealth and honor? Ela bimina orech yamim. Okay. Orech yamim ika Oshe B'chavod leka. Does it mean to say that in the right hand of Torah there is a length of days but not wealth and honor? Oshe B'chavod leka. There's not. Ela lemay minin ba... Rather, to those who approach it from the right hand, we'll see what that means in a second, they have not only length of days, but also wealth and honor. And to those who approach it with the left hand, they only get wealth and honor. So Rashi gives two interpretations of what this means. One is that what the right hand means that you really invest your heart and soul into it. In other words, you invest your energy. If you want to do something, you use your right hand, assuming everyone's a righty. Everyone's assuming you're a righty. So if you're a righty, you use your right hand for something that really requires a lot of strength. Right? It requires a lot of strength. Whereas the left hand is something that's a weaker hand. So it means you're not putting your whole soul into it. So, what, so the first interpretation of Rashi is if you put your full effort into learning Torah, then you're going to have not only wealth and honor, but also length of days. If you do it halfway, you know, you use your weaker hand, so then you're not going to gain the full reward. You're not going to have the length of days, only the wealth and honor. The other interpretation Rashi gives, which seems to be the more common interpretation, is that the right hand means you're doing it for the right reasons. You're doing it the Shema. The left hand means you're doing it because you have something to gain out of it. You want to get a degree so people will honor you or you want, uh, you, you want to be uh, uh, you, you want to impress girls. You know, I had, I had friends in high school that would learn because they wanted to impress girls. You know, they would, the girls would see that they knew a lot of stuff and they would get, you know, they, they wanted to find uh, Shidduch. You know, so that's the, that's the wrong reason. I think uh, we're talking about the Nagil and the Drega show, maybe the Dabar Mitoch Dabar, like well, originally it was called Gomorrah, not right. what we call Gomorrah today. Right. Right, of course. Well, but a person, requ- it requires both pr- right intention and also a lot of effort. It's not something simple. A person can't just affect me. That's the goal that they're trying to... Right, of course. Yeah, for sure. Ultimately. Ultimately it is. Now, what does the Gemara say now? Amar, okay, so Amar Rabbi Yirmiya, Amar Rabbi Shimon Belakish, Rabbi Yirmiya said that Rabbi Shimon Belakish said, Shnei Tabadei Chachamim, so we have all these cases of the Shnei Tabadei Chachamim. The first one was Mechadidin. Now we have... That they are easy with each other in halacha. What does that mean? One of two possibilities. Rashi brings for, for the root of nun chet he. One is that they lower each other. They're humble with each other. In other words, in their dealings, they're not arrogant from the word uh, to, to, to be lower. Okay? <laughs> to be humble and, and in their dealings. The other one is nochin means shemanchim. That they, they, uh, they guide each other. Okay, in in halacha. In other words, that they're pleasant with each other, and not either that they're pleasant with each other, or that they that they guide one another towards understanding. Okay, like lech neche etam, go guide the people that Hashem said to Moshe Rabbeinu. In other words, Socratic way, it's more of a instead of battling with each other, they're guiding each other towards the truth in some way. Yeah. So Hakadosh Baruch Hu. In that case, Hashem makshiv lahem. He listens to them. Shnei Marsa says, "Aznit beru yirei Hashem," because it says, "Then, then those who fear Hashem speak to each other." Right? The end dibur ella 
Nachat. And what does dibur mean? It means nachat, which again, either means soft speaking, it's interpreting it, or it means guiding, like yadber, as it's going to say. Shinemar yadber amim tachtenu. Yadber amim tachtenu means we should dominate. In other words, we should lead the other nations. Okay, so yadber can be to dominate, or it can mean to deal softly. So one or, one or the other. Um, here, it's in being interpreted, it would seem the simplest reading of it here means to lead. Yadber amim tachtenu. Okay, but Rashi does say another possibility is that it means to be gentle. In other words, in, that because it comes from the word dibur, you could think of it as diplomatic leading, as opposed to leading by force. And therefore, yad ber um, could be interpreted as being soft and being humble as well, as opposed to being uh, uh, to, to to leading by domination in a in a forceful way. Sounds like what suave by carrying stick. Maybe something like that, yeah. So, my ulochoshveshimo. So, it says at the end of that pasuk that Hashem is that as the Yirei Hashem Ishal Reeu Vayekshef Hashem, that the, those who fear Hashem speak to each other and Hashem hears. Vayishma Vayikatev Sefer Zikaron the Fan Lifanav. And then the, the book is going to, of, of remembrance is going to be written before Hashem. Yirei Hashem ulochoshveshimo. For those who fear God and who think of His name. This is from Malachi. We read this for Shabbat Gadol, I believe. Shabbat Gadol. Haftarah. It's a Malachi. No, it's, it's, it's a, quoted in Pirkei Avot, but it's a pasuk. Uh, it's, it's a pasuk for Malachi that they quote in the Pirkei Avot. So in, in a, um, in, it's actually for the Haftarah of Shabbat so the, la- the end of Malachi, the third pair. So, um, okay, so what is it? So, what does it mean, those who think of the name of God? Even if a person thinks of doing a mitzvah <coughs> and something comes up and he's not able to do it, God gives him Credit as if he did it. In other words, Choshveshimo means he thought of it. In other words, if his intention is in the right place, God gives him a lot of credit. So, we, so the, the purpose of this Agadah, though, is to tell us that Talmidei Chachamim should challenge each other in their debates that sharpens one, to sharpen one another. They should also lead one another nicely and gently towards the truth. And these are all good. Am Rabbi Chinana. Rabbi Chinana Bar Idi said, Kol HaOsem Mitzvah. Anybody who does a mitzvah exactly as it's supposed to be done, that person is not going to hear any bad news. Because it says that a person who keeps a mitzvah is not going to know any bad. In other words, he's going to have only good news. I'm Rabbi Asi, Rabbi Chanina. Rabbi Asi said that, and some say it was Rabbi Chanina. Even if God made a decree, the person who does the mitzvah perfectly can override the decree. Because it says uh, that uh, since the word of the king is Shilton, has authority, who is going to say to the king, what are you doing? In other words, who's going to challenge the king? But what's the very next pasuk? Shomer mitzvah lo that one who does a mitzvah, who guards a mitzvah, is not going to know anything bad. In other words, first it tells us that Hashem's will is inviolable and will never change. But a person who does a mitzvah, for him, it could be changed. There could be exceptions. Amar Rabbi Abba, Rabbi Abba said, Amar Rabbi Shimon Lakish. Then Rabbi Shimon Lakish said, Shenei Talmidei Chachamim, another, another Agadah about two Talmidei Chachamim. Hamakshivim zelazeh halacha. They listen to one another. They don't just guide one another, but they actually listen. That's, this is probably the hardest one of all. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Shomei Lekolan. If they listen to each other, God listens to them. The Holy One, blessed be He, listens to them. Shneimar Hayoshevet Baganim Chaverim, as it says, the the one who sits in the Ganim in the gardens, Chaverim, friends, Makshivim LeKolech, friends are listening to your voice. Hashmiini, let me listen to your voice. Okay. In other words, what he's saying is, if your friends are listening to your voice, when the friends are listening to one another, Hashmi'ini, I'll listen. Let me listen. Vim enosin ken. And if they don't listen to one another, Gormin la shemistaleket mi Israel. They cause the shechina to leave Israel. Shneamar berach dodi udme lechalitzvi la ofer ayelim. Right. That, that she, right. It's from Shira Shirim, uh, and he's saying, run away, my beloved. In other words, if you want to listen, if we're going to get along, and we're all listening to one another, Hashem's going to listen to us. In the exchange of ideas, we're exchanging ideas with each other and showing each other respect. Hashem is going to respect our word as well. If we're not, we're not listening to one another, we're being stubborn, we're refusing to uh, share ideas, Hashem is going, to, is going to say, run away. In other words, Hashem is going to, so to speak, run away from us and not listen either. Amr Rabbi Abba, Rabbi Abba said, Amr Rabbi Shimon Lakish, that Rabbi Shimon Lakish said, Shnei Tabadei Chachamim, Hamadgilim Zela Zeba Halacha. So Rashi interprets this to mean, two Tabadei Chachamim who get together Bechavruta, to study halacha, 
even though they're not, they're Talmidei Chachamim, but they're not scholars. They are students who get together Bechavruta to study together, even though they're not able to achieve the same heights because they don't have a teacher, they don't have somebody to guide them and to keep them free of error, but they're doing their best. In other words, they're doing the absolute best they can to learn. HaKadosh Baruch Hu Avan. Hashem loves them, even if they might make mistakes. As it says in, again, in Shira Shirim, His mistake is love for me. In other words, even though, that's how they're interpreting it, like from the word lidaleg to skip something uh, or, or to well first it says vidiglo hamadgilim that they're gathering together in a group but it's also interpreting it to mean that uh, that this gathering is loved by Hashem even though it's not a, it's an imperfect gathering even though it's a, a gathering where mistakes might be made because they're not the most qualified Talmud Chachamim but Hashem loves what they're doing anyway Amar Avarava says this is assuming that they have have some basic familiarity with how to learn. Obviously, if they're completely incompetent, they're not going to accomplish anything. And also, and it also presumes that there's nobody in town who can teach them. And since they can't, uh, they, they, there's nobody to teach them. They're doing the absolute best that they can with the tools that they have, and they have a basic familiarity with Torah, and they're able to get something done. So it's not ideal. They might be imperfect. They might make mistakes here and there or errors, but they're doing the absolute best that they can to achieve. Uh, the most that they can given their circumstances and God sees that in a very positive light. Um, uh, so now we say Abba uh, 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 Somebody who gives a loan is greater than somebody who uh, who gives charity. And somebody who puts money into the pocket is greater than anybody. In other words, what it means is if you go into partnership. So if you give a loan to a poor person, they, they have to pay you back. If you go into partnership with a poor person, you're sharing the expense and you're sharing the profits. So that's even better. Um, because it puts the poor person in a place of dignity. That's like um, Rambam's formulation of tzedakah. Right, exactly, exactly. You produce a job for him. Right, so you're basically going into business with him, so, so you're preserving his dignity while allowing him to have money. I'm Rabbi Abba, I'm Rabbi Shem ben Lakish, and Rabbi Abba said that Rabbi Shem ben Lakish said, Im talmid chacham nokim v'noter kanachash, if a Talmud Chacham is vengeful and, uh, and, and, and grudge-holding like a snake... Okay, in other words, he's a tough personality. Bind him onto your loins. In other words, even if a Talmud Chacham has a harsh personality, and he's a tough guy to deal with, but he's a Talmud Chacham, you should hang around him. Okay, because you'll benefit from the learning. That's what Rashi says. Uh, where does it say that? You're going to benefit from his learning. However... If he's an ignoramus, all right, he says, Even if an Amaaretz is very pious, don't live in his neighborhood. In other words, you might say to yourself, it might be the nicest Amaaretz you ever saw, but hanging around him is not going to improve you the way hanging around the Talmud Chacham is. So even though the Talmud Chacham might be a harsh personality, he might be a difficult personality, he might be, a, 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 you know, sometimes a, hard to be around, but he, you'll learn from him. Whereas the um, Amaaretz, he might be the nicest, friendliest neighbor ever, but at the end of the day, he's not going to teach you anything. As Rashi says, that really he doesn't know the particulars of the mitzvot, so his piety is, is an incomplete type of piety. And now you're going to learn from him the wrong things. So that would be bad. Amar Rav Kana, Rav Kana said, Amar Rav Yishma ben Lakish, Rav Yishma ben Lakish said, Amar Rav Asi, Amar Rav Yishma ben Lakish. So some say that it was Rav Asi that said this. Amar Rav and some say, Amar Rav Abba, Amar Rav Yishma ben Lakish. Some say it was Rav Abba saying in the name of Rav Yishma ben Lakish. Kola migadel kelev rabbe toch beto. This is also a very famous saying. Anybody who raises a bad dog in their house, they have a pit bull or Rottweiler or something like that. He holds back kindness from his house. Because who's going to want to go collect alms at the house of the guy who has the Rottweiler and a huge sign that says, Beware of dog. He's not going to go in. So he's going to lose the opportunity to give tzedakah. As it says, As it says, He holds back from his friend, I think it's Chassid. Yeah, Chassid, yeah. So the person holds back kindness from his friends. And Shekin Bilushon Yivanit, and in Greek, Korin Lakelev Lamas. Lamas is the word for a, a, a dog in Greek. So, therefore, what it means is if you have a dog, Mira Eu Chasid, you're holding back from your friend kindness because they're not going to want to come to your house. 
Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak Amar Af Porek Mimenu Yirat Shamayim, and the end of the pasuk is Yirat Shaday Yazov that he leaves fear of God. He says not only is this dog going to cause you to not do Chesed because it's going to keep people away from your home, also it's going to cause you to leave fear of Hashem um, because the end of the pasuk says Yirat Shaday Yazov that he's going to leave the fear of God. In other words, it's going to get you into a bad state of mind. It's going to prevent you from doing kindness and also cause you not to fear God. One reason why that might be is because because perhaps having the dog there makes you feel uh, protected, makes you feel invincible, makes you feel that you don't have to worry about anything, and, you're, you're and you know, therefore you're not fearful. Dog. A mean dog. Mm, mean dog. Only a bad dog. is talking about a kill a This is kill a Only a bad dog. Yeah, no, that's what it said before. Kill a Not a not a good dog. Good dogs are okay. How you can tell the difference? It's very complicated. But um, but I didn't, I didn't grow up with dogs. yeah. But a nice dog is okay. For me, all the dogs are. <laughs> but a mean dog is, is bad and it takes away Yerat Shamayim and it certainly takes away the opportunity to do chesed because people are afraid and I know that I've you know even my parents have a dog and it's a nice dog but you know people are afraid to come over for Shabbat some people are just afraid of dogs so then you have a hard time getting guests they don't want to come because the dog makes them uncomfortable and then they're scared of it even if it's not a scary dog it can sometimes be a liability for doing chesed if, um, if people don't want to come over it could be I hate touching me. yeah it could be a challenge yeah and then they come to the table they want to participate ahahi uh, it that so there was a woman who came to a house to bake. In other words, she was a poor woman. She didn't have an oven. So a next door neighbor who was, or whatever, uh, allowed her to come in and to use his oven to bake. And Kalba, he happened to have a dog that started barking at her. It akar and she was pregnant and had a miscarriage. Marla, he said to her. Mar Deveta, the master of the house, said to her, Lo tid chali, the shakili nibe, the shakili tofred, don't be afraid of him. I took out his teeth and I took out his claws. In other words, he's been declawed, de de toothed, whatever that is, I don't know what they call that. Um, so uh, you don't have to be afraid of him. Amrale, so Amrale, she said to him, Shakola tebutech vishadiach hisre. She said, Take your kindness and throw it on the thorns. Kevar nad valad, because my my valad, my, uh, my uh, 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 what do you call it, fetus, has already moved. In other words, meaning I, it already caused me to lose the baby, which is very sad. In other words, it's showing you that even a dog that's been incapacitated, if it's a scary dog, the point is that it's not about, it's not just about whether the dog can actually do harm. They'll say, oh, I have a pit bull, but it's really the nicest pit bull ever and it would never hurt anybody. But the fact is, if you see a pit bull barking at you, you're going to run away. It doesn't matter if it happens to be the nicest pit bull ever. Um, it's it's going to be, it's going to look scary and therefore... Uh, it's going to be scary. Like, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the Heffalump movie, with the, that, that movie for the kid movie. It's like that. There's this, he looks like a monster, so everyone's afraid of him, even though really he might be nice. It doesn't matter. Amar uh, Ravuna, Ravuna said, My dichtiv, and this is a very famous pasuk from uh, Kohelet, Semach b'achor b'yaldutecha. Young man, be happy in your youth. Okay? V'tivachali b'cha b'mei b'churotecha. And may your heart be glad in your young days. You should go by the ways of your heart. And by the sight of your eyes. But know that on all of this, God is going to bring you in judgment. So it's almost like somebody saying, Go do whatever you want. Yeah, have a great time. But remember, you're going to suffer for it. So it's not a very nice thing. You know, it's uh, telling you, go enjoy your life. Don't think about anything. Go after the sight of your eyes. Have fun. But remember, you're going to suffer. You're going to suffer consequences. God's going to hold you responsible. So what's going on in this pasuk? It seems contradictory because on one hand, he's saying, go do whatever you want. And on the other hand, he all of a sudden switches gears and says, God is going to hold you responsible. So, Ad kan divrei yitzahara, mikan ve'elach divrei yitzahara tov. And according to the first interpretation, it's two. And Rav Huna is saying two different statements. This pasuk is two different sides. The Yetzer Hara started out the pasuk and said, oh, go do whatever you want. Don't worry. It's going to be fine. Life is going to be great. Like making a deal with the devil. You know, it's going to be wonderful. And then at the end, it's the Yetzer HaTov saying, hey, wait, remember, everything you do, you're going to be held responsible for. So we're held accountable for it. So the point is that the pasuk is showing you two different voices 
It's almost like your mind, the conscience, with the, the, the nice angel and the devil on each side of the shoulder. You know, one saying, the, one saying oh, go do whatever you want, and the other one saying, no, 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 no. So it's, a, it's two different voices. Reish Lakish, Amar, Ad Kan Le Divrei Torah, Mikan Ve Lech Lamasim, Tovim. Interesting, Reish Lakish says, no, interpret it differently. It's not that the first half was the Yitzhar Haran, the second half was the Yitzhar Hatov. The first half being the evil inclination, goading you onto evil, and the second half being the good inclination, saying, wait, you're going to be accountable. But actually, Reish Lakish says they're both positive. Positive. That when it says, go after your heart, go after your eyes, enjoy yourself, it's talking about learning Torah. But when it says, remember, God is going to hold you responsible, it means ma'asim tovim, which means at the end of the day, make sure you do something. Don't just sit and learn all the time. So it's almost like we say to a kid, go to yeshiva, you, you finished high school, go to yeshiva for a couple of years, you have time to go learn, go learn in Israel, people will go to learn in Israel for a few years, but at the end, remember, you've got to do something with your life. Don't just, you know, enjoy your youth, enjoy your, enjoy your learning, but if you're not doing mitzvot, you're not, it's, you're not getting the full experience. That's why now, you know, many of the, especially the girls' schools, when the girls go to learn, they also have community service, they do, you know, all kinds of things that are really masem um, mitzvot. I don't think they do that as much for the boys, which is probably unfortunate. They should also be involved in chesed and the other things that go together with Torah, if they're doing it. Birit um, tahorah. So now we come back to the Mishnah, which said that this garter thing that holds up the stockings is tahorah is pure, meaning it can't be mekabel tum'ah. The reason, as we're going to see, is because there were only two things that, two types of uh, items that are mekabel tum'ah, as we've seen earlier in the Masechet too. One is a, a, a vessel that serves a function, and the other is a piece of clothing or an ornament. But in a vessel that serves an ornament, or a vessel that serves a piece of clothing is not in and of itself a vessel. So since the purpose of this strap is to hold up stockings, it's actually serving the stocking. It's not serving you directly, it's serving the stocking, and that's why it's not Mikabel Tumaz, we're going to see. Amar Rav Yudah Abirit Zo Etzada. Rav Yudah says, you know what a birit is? It's a bracelet. Mativ Rav Yosef, Rav Yosef said, what are you talking about? Birit or Rav Yosef, Rav Shabbat? How could you say that a birit is a, a, a bracelet when a, it's, we said in the Mishnah that a birit is not subject to Tumav, Ilu etzadat me'ahi? But we know that a bracelet, a metal bracelet, for sure is susceptible to Tumah. So Hachi Kamar, this is what he meant, birit tachat etzadat omedet. What he meant was a birit is a type of bracelet. In other words, it's a ring that goes around the woman's leg to hold up her stocking. So like a bracelet on the arm, it's a bracelet around the leg. Yativ Ravim Rav Huna. Once Ravim and Rav Huna were sitting together, Kamei Rav Yirmiya in front of Rav Yirmiya. Yativ Rav Yirmiya of Kamei Namnei. Rav Yirmiya was there. He was supposed to be the teacher, but he was falling asleep. So the students start having a discussion while the teacher is taking a nap. Yativ Ravim Vekamar and Ravim is sitting and says, Birit Beachad Kivalim Bishtaim. I think that the only difference between Birit and Kivalim is that Birit is on one leg. In other words, what were those two things mentioned in the Mishnah? One of them is, uh, is allowed to be worn and one of them is not allowed to be worn. So he said, you know what? Birit is around one leg. Kivalim is around the two legs. That's when, you, when she has it on two legs. Amar le Ravuna. Ravuna says, Elov Elov Bishtaim. You're wrong. Both of them are worn on two legs. In other words, you have to hold up both stockings. However, Umatilin shel shelet benehen venasu kivalim. But the difference between uh, the birit, which is not subject to impurity, and which is allowed to be worn on Shabbat, and the and the kivalim, which are not, which are, can become tameh and cannot be worn on Shabbat, is that the kivalim have a chain in between them. There's a chain connecting these. In other words, the strap goes around the leg, leg one, strap goes around leg two, and then there's a chain in between them. That's the difference. So because of the chain, now it can be mikabel tumah. And because of the chain, it's now considered more decorative, so she can't wear it out on Shabbat. Because there's something decorative about it. Okay? And remember, decorative things are more problematic because maybe she's going to want to show the chain part to her friend. So the Gemara asks, uh, Are you telling me that just the fact that it has a chain in between these two straps make it all of a sudden mekabel tumah, all of a sudden it can be subject to tumah? And maybe you're going to tell me it's just like Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmani said earlier in this Masechet. I'm Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmani. I'm Rabbi Yochanan. That Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmani said that Rabbi Yochanan said, "Minayin l'mashmiya kol b'kli matachot shu tame shenemar kol davar sheyavo ba'esh afilu dibor b'mashma." That we said that any that any item 
He had said, how do we know that a musical instrument is considered a kali? It's considered a vessel that's subject to tumah. Because it says, kol davar. Anything, and davar is dibur, sound. Even something that makes sound is subject to tumah. Which we said before, even the little clapper in the bell makes all the difference. Without the clapper in the bell, it wouldn't be mekabel tumah. With the clapper in the bell, when it functions, it is. So maybe you'll say here too, the chain, with the chain... It's makabel tuma. Without the chain, it's not. But bishlama hatam kabaule lakala vikavid maase. Over there, the bell. The reason why without the clapper is because it doesn't function. When you put the clapper in, it does function. However, hacha over here, my maase kavid. Over here, what function does this chain have that's more than when it didn't have a chain? Why is it more of a vessel when it has a chain? The, the end of the day is it's still holding up the stockings with or without the chain. So why is that so significant? Actually, it, it does serve a function. Because Rabbi Barachana said that Rabbi Yochanan said, There was one family in Yerushalayim that used to take very big steps when they would walk. You've heard this? Yeah. No, no, but I thought it was make it wrong. Yeah. Vahayu noshrot. And what happened was that the girls would not be deemed virgins when they got married because they had such wide stance, such wide steps, that they wouldn't have the signs of virginity when they were married. So Asulen Kivalim, Vetilu Shal Shelet Benhem. That's why they put these straps around their legs and they put chains to shorten their steps. Shelo Gasot, Velo noshrot. So what do you see? You see that this chain does add a new dimension of function. And it's not a new dimension of function vis-a-vis the stockings, because the stockings are all actually held up by the strap that goes around the leg with or without a chain. What does the chain do? It holds back the stride of the person. That's a function for the person herself, for the woman herself. And that's why it adds and it makes it mikabel tuma because now it's a vessel that's serving the woman not serving the stocking anymore you see that okay so now we say it arbo rabbi yermia rabbi yermia woke up good time to wake up from his nap amar lahu he said to them yashar you're correct vechen amar rabbi yochanan that's exactly what rabbi yochanan said that that's the difference that the the uh, difference between the um, the version that cannot be worn the birit that can be worn out and isn't mikabel tuma and the kivalim which cannot be worn out because they're ornamental okay and they are mikabel tuma is this chain in between them kiyata rav dimi am rav yochanan when rav dimi came from eretz israel he said that rav yochanan said minayim arik kol shushu tame mitzitz that how do we know now we learned earlier in the masechet in the second parak that in order for a garment to be subject to tuma it either has to be three by three etzbaot three by three finger breadths or three by three tifachim depending on the circumstances now what we also what he, what Rabbi Yochanan says is if an item is designed to be less by its nature it's designed to be less in other words if you have a piece of fabric so then we get into measurements is it three by three tifachim oh for a wealthy person maybe for a not so wealthy person a smaller one would be a significant piece of fabric because it's used as a patch okay but if something is d- by design one, it's by, by one finger by one finger, but it's designed to be that way. It's not just material, so we're not looking at it quantitatively, but it's designed to be tiny, so then it would still be Mechabel Tumah, because that's its nature, to be small. How do we know that? Mitzitz from the, uh, from the head plate of the Kohen Gadol. Amar Abay Abay said, Vitzitz Ariku, what are you talking about? <coughs> the tzitz, the head plate of the Kohen Gadol, is not woven. So why would you bring a proof about woven items? Vatani, we learned in a bright that tzitz kamin tas shel zahav. Because the tzitz is a type of golden plate. Verochav shte etzbaot. It's two etzbaot wide. Umukaf meozun laozun. And it goes from one year to the other. Vekatuv alav bebet shitin yud hei lemala vekodesh lamed lemat. And there are two lines. On top it says yud hei. In other words, it says Hashem's name on the first line. And on the second line it says, V'kodesh Lamed. In other words, it says, Kodesh La. The, the fir- full text is supposed to be, Kodesh Lashem. But they put the word Hashem on top, and Kodesh Le on the bottom, because they wanted Hashem's name to be top. Okay? So, uh, you can see pictures of it. So the Kodesh Le, Le is actually held back. It's like to the right side. The Hashem's name is a little bit to the left side, so you still would be, it would still be read Kodesh Lashem, but the word Hashem is actually above the word Kodesh Le. But the point is, it's on a golden piece, not on a woven piece. So, 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 says, but, uh, so, so that was the first, that was what the Chachamim said. The Chachamim said that the name of Hashem is on top, 
And the word Kodesh Lamed is on the bottom. There's a story about how Rabbi Eliezer Rabbi Yossi got to go into the treasure house of Rome one time. And I saw the tzitz, because they had captured it from the Beit HaMikdash. And it was all written on one line. It wasn't on two lines, with Hashem's name and Kodesh Le on the bottom. But the point here is not about the tzitz. The point is that the tzitz was not a woven item. So why are you telling me that we learned about woven items from the tzitz? Ki salik Rav Dimi li Naharda when Rav Dimi came to Naharda Shalach lo we sent to them the following message Dvarim shamarti lachem ta'utem biyadi What I said to you was a mistake when I brought the, when I told you that we learned it from tzitz I was wrong which we figured out already but he told them I was wrong Biram kachamru this is what they said Mishum Rabbi Yochanan in the name of Rabbi Yochanan Minayim the takshit kol shushutamay where do we learn the idea that an ornament of any size a metal ornament even a tiny one is still mekabel tumah that's what we learn from the tzitz because even though the tzitz is a small golden plate of only two finger breadths wide less than three by three, that's for sure, and yet it's mekabel tumah for sure. So too, any ornament, a self-sufficient ornament, if it's a piece of raw material, then it can have a quantitative measure. But if it is a, if it's an ornament, a self-sufficient ornament, then the size is not going to matter, the quantity is not going to matter. Uminayin larig kosher and where do we get the idea that a woven thing of any size is mekabel tumah, if that woven thing is a self-sufficient thing, not just a piece of raw material, may obeged. We remember the word obeged that we spent a lot of time analyzing in the second parak. That comes back again. Tanu Rabbanan the rabbis taught Arig Koshu Tame, Vitakshit Koshu Tame. That a woven thing of any size is Tame and an ornament of any size is Tame. Arig Vitakshit. Let's say it's half made of uh, half woven, half metal. So then what? So again it would be uh, also tame musab sak ala beged shetame mishum arik and you can add sak you can add uh, uh, canvas to the category of beged which because it's also considered woven okay it's also in the same category we're going to see more about this uh, further in the Gemara when we analyze this bright in more detail Amar Rava says Arig koshu tame me obeget. Where do we get the idea that a woven thing of any size is subject to tumah from obeget? Takshit koshu tame mitzit. How do we know that any size metal ornament is tame? We learn that from the head plate of the Kohen Gadol. Arig ve takshit koshu tame mi kol kilima ase. What pasuk teaches us? Because it doesn't say in the Brayta what the pasuk is. What pasuk teaches us? That if you have metal and, wo- and woven cloth combined into an ornament, that even that doesn't require any minimum measurement, even though it's not completely metal and it's not completely woven, from the words kol kilima ase, all kilima, k- kilima ase, any type of fashioned item. Okay? Amar lehaume rabbanan rava. One of the students said to rava, that pasuk kol kilima ase, how bemidyan ketiv? That's the, that is stated in the context of the war against Midian. What type of tumah did they have to deal with in the war against Midian? Tumat met, the tumah of death. That's a very strict tumah. So maybe you can only prove that any, that kol kalima ase, that a combination of a woven item and a metal item, that neither of which meet the minimum sh- requirements of size, but are combined into an ornament, maybe that only applies, that rule that it's still mekabel tumat, only applies to tumat met, only to the impurity of the dead. Answer, Amar Lehi said to him, Gamar kili kili mehatam. We make a gizera shava. It talks about with regular tumat, the word kli. Kol kili asheri asemelacha. Any vessel in which work is, or with which work is done. Okay, and from here we learn kol kilima ase, that even a combination of woven and metal into one entity is still, if it's a self sufficient entity, it's still going to be mekabel tumah. We learn that. So we have to learn what is the definition of a kali. Does it need a minimum requirement? We learn that it doesn't from. These pasukim. One pasuk teaches us about woven things, or one source teaches us that one source teaches us about metallic things, which is the tzitz. The word obeged teaches us about a totally woven thing. That if it's a self-sufficient woven thing, it's mekabel tuma no matter what. And the words kol kalima ase teach us 
that when we talk about kali, when we talk about an, a, a vessel, even a, a, a combination vessel that's made partially of woven material and partially of metal, if it's a self-sufficient entity, is mekabel tumah, despite the fact that it is less than the minimum size that would normally be required. And we will end here for today.